continuing in our uh, series that we started last week, quick little just two-week series talking about Jonah. We called it uh, Hide and Seek because we're looking at sort of uh, the sort of two parts of Jonah's story of the, the hide part. That's what we looked at last week, and now we're going to look at how Jonah eventually does what God called him to do. So last week we kicked off this series talking about Jonah, and uh, we talked about how uh, we, uh, this is a story that we all know. We've all grown up hearing about it in children's church or wherever it might have been, and even people who don't come to church typically know the story of Jonah pretty well. But a lot of t- times we're kind of presented it with the, the fishing tale. We talked about the, uh, the, the, the story of a fish, and a lot of times when you hear the stories from the fishermen, the stories are a little exaggerated, and you never know, quite know what exactly the truth is. And we talked about how sometimes the story of Jonah we, we hear, uh, there's a lot more to it when we look to the scripture than, than that story that we kind of heard the brief version of in Sunday school or when you read it in the, in, the, in the children's Bible. There's so much more to this story. And we looked at Jonah and uh, this, this, this man who was a prophet and God told him to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. And we talked about how it was a scary task and that's usually what we hear in the children's version of the story, that it was scary and Jonah didn't want to go. But we looked into the scripture to see that there was actually so much more to why Jonah didn't want to go. Because Jonah had some junk in his life that he was holding on to, some bitterness, some anger, some unforgiveness. And, and when Jonah is told to go preach to Nineveh, he doesn't want to do it. Not just because it was a scary task, but ultimately because he doesn't want them to repent. When he hears destruction is coming their way, he doesn't want to step in the way to, to, you know, for them to maybe repent and be saved from it. These are the enemies of God's people. These are people who are notorious for being cruel. These are idol worshipers. And so Jonah's like, I, I don't, God, God, I don't want to go. Like it, it, he says at the end that he didn't want to go because he knows how compassionate, how full of grace God is, that he relents from sending calamity. And so Jonah runs. He wants nothing to do with this, so he runs, and he goes, and he boards this ship, and he heads towards Tarshish, this, this place that was com- the complete opposite direction. He is getting out of town. He is running from this task, and we see that God sent a storm, and Jonah was thrown overboard, and he is swallowed by a fish, and we looked at how all these sailors turned to God. They feared God. They made sacrifices to God, and despite Jonah's rebellion, how we can still see that God is at work in this story. And so last week, we kind of finished off our story with Jonah being swallowed by this large fish, and today we're going to pick it up right there. So we talked about how Jonah hid. He ran from God. He was hiding from God. We talked about how the, the scripture says that he was hiding from God. Not that he was running from the task or his responsibility, but he's attempting to run and hide from God, which we see that he does not succeed in doing. Because as he himself said, this is the God who made the land and the sea. And so God, uh, Jonah ran and God pursued. He didn't just give up on Jonah. He didn't just pick a new person, but he pursued him. And we talked about how God pursues each one of us. At one point, each of us were rebels. We were like Jonah. We were running from God. We had our backs turned to him. And But God pursued us. He came after us. He sent Jesus into this world to live the life that we were not living, the life that we could not live. And then Jesus gave up that life on a cross for us. And we talked about how God wants to use his people. And he provides opportunities for his people to be used for his purpose. And we talked about how The enemy doesn't like that, right? The enemy does not want us to be used by God. He does not want our lives to be filled with the joy of knowing we're being used by the God of the universe to be a part of his purposes. And so where God provides an opportunity, the enemy provides a boat, right? That boat was there for Jonah, and we talked about how there's always a boat. The enemy comes in with a boatload of excuses of all the reasons why we shouldn't jump into action, why we should not take advantage of that opportunity that God puts in front of us, and how ultimately 
It's all intended to rob us of that joy of being used by God. And we learned the simple truth from Jonah that when we disobey, things don't go well, right? That simple truth that we teach our kids, that disobedience does not bring anything good into our lives. When we disobey, things don't go well. So God had a plan. He invited Jonah in to be a part of something incredible, something special that he was doing. But it was ultimately Jonah's own disobedience that brought him into this stinky situation. And so that's what we talked about last week, and I want to jump right back in where we uh, left off. So Jonah is swallowed by this fish. He is thrown overboard, and he's left for dead in the middle of the ocean. The, the sailors were pleading, like they're doing everything, like we don't want to throw this man into the water. They're fearing God, like we don't want this man's blood on our hands. But eventually, they have to throw him in, and then this big fish comes and swallows Jonah. And the storm is calmed. And so God provided this fish. So it's not exactly the most comfortable rescue boat, but it was a rescue boat. God saved Jonah. He was there, and he is drowning, and he is left for dead. This is the end of him. And God provides this massive fish to come and swallow Jonah. And from the belly of the fish, we see Jonah praise. He has this moment alone with God. I mean, <laughs> there's not very many distractions in the belly of a fish. There's not much more for him to do than to think about what he did to get himself into this stinky situation. And so he talks to God. And it's a very interesting prayer we see. You can read through it in Jonah chapter 2. And But just to kind of summarize it, he never actually says, I'm sorry. He never actually apologizes to God for running and all these things, but he does acknowledge that God has saved his life, that God has spared his life. He acknowledges that he got himself into this situation, that he was drowning, that he was dead, this was the end of him, and God has spared him, and God has rescued him, and so he does thank God for that, and he thanks God for being good to him, and he basically ends with saying, I'll hold up my end of the deal now. I will do what you ask of me. And so three days later, God commanded this fish, and the fish vomited Jonah up onto the shore. The fish does exactly what God commanded him to do. So it's kind of interesting. When we, when we see in this story that we see that the wind and the waves obey God, that fish obey God, it's just those pesky humans that <laughs> seem to have a problem with it, right? <laughs> And so now we dive into chapter 3. Jonah's now been vomited up on the shore. And what I love is that chapter 3 begins the very same, like almost exactly as chapter 1 did. God comes right back to Jonah and says, all right, let's try this again. Okay, man. <laughs> guess what, Jonah? I am calling you to go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Just as God started, we go through the whole fish incident and the drowning incident and the boat and all this stuff, and then we're right back at square one. God comes to Jonah and says, guess what I want you to do? The same thing I told you before, nothing has changed. <laughs> and so uh, this time Jonah was obedient. He does it. So Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he goes there to preach against it. He's going to go there and proclaim this message that would be given to him by God. So God would provide this message to him. All Jonah had to do was go and preach it. He's just got to be the messenger. So are you ready for the great sermon, the great message from Jonah, the great word that Jonah brought to the city? This is it. 40, day, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's it. Like, that is the message. This is the whole thing. This is what he preached. It's right there in quotes. He goes into the city, and he preaches this message. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. Here's the crazy thing. That's eight words. Eight words. But um, even one better. In Hebrew, only five words. <laughs> five words. Can you imagine if I stepped up on the stage this morning and said, wow, guys, I am just so excited with the message that God has put on my heart to share with you guys. I pray that it challenges us, that it convicts us. I've been just preparing this message all week. I'm so excited to share it. Here it is. And then I say five words, and then we all leave. Like, <laughs> what? Five words. Five words. And this is it. Just five words. It's so funny to think 
all the headache that he went through to avoid going to preach this five-word message. Five words. He goes through three days in the belly of a fish to avoid preaching a five-word sermon. So Jonah steps into the city, and he goes and he preaches these five simple words. That's it. And then this is the response. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God, and, but, but so much more than this. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose up from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds, or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion. Turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So Jonah comes in, and he just delivers this five-word message that was given to him by God. He steps in. He says the five words, and this is the response we get. The people believed in that message. The people believed God. So I want to point out, it wasn't Jonah. They believed God. They believed God. And, 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 and it's, this is an amazing response. I mean, it's so... Uh, so powerful that the king comes in and issues this citywide decree for every man and every animal that we're all going to fast. Every man and animal, right? So not just the humans, but the cows and the chickens and the geese. We are all fasting, everybody. No one's going to drink a drop of water and no one's going to eat a bite of food, nothing. And then the king, he throws off his robes and he puts on sackcloth. He puts on this, you know, basically burlap, and it's this symbol of repentance. He rips off the robe, and he puts on this burlap. And then he tells everyone to do the same thing. And not only that, not only the people are going to put on burlap, but the animals, too. Go out there and get your cows, and you're not going to feed them. You're not going to give them anything to eat. You're not going to give them anything to drink, and you're going to put burlap on them. And get your chickens and make <laughs> How ridiculous is this? And this is all coming from the king issuing this decree. I mean, you want to talk about government overreach. You're <laughs> you guys are not going to eat, and you're going to go dress up your cows and your chickens. And we're going to call urgently on the Lord, and we are going to turn from our violence, and we are going to turn away from our sin. And who knows, maybe the Lord will relent. What an incredible, incredible response. I just love this. And so, I mean, that I think really just emphasizes the conviction here, right? Can you imagine the king actually making this decree, how crazy it must have seemed? You're going to go dress, you're going to go dress up your chickens. You're going to change your clothes. You're not going to eat, not going to drink, nothing. Your animals, your chickens, none of them, not, no one's eating in this town incredible and we're going to fast and we're going to pray and we are going to turn from our evil ways and maybe just maybe god will spare us and they do it i mean there's over 120,000 people in nineveh and they all believed this message and they repented and they turned from their evil and they put on burlap and they dress up their animals and they fasted and they called out to god and then verse 10 when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Incredible. Incredible story. Now, typically, this is where the Sunday school lesson ends, right? Jonah went. He finally mustered up the courage. He preached that message that God gave him, and the whole city changed from their evil. Woohoo! story's over. Well, the story is not over. In fact, there's a whole other chapter here, and so many times we miss this part, right? The story usually ends with, wow, Jonah did it. He got the courage. He went there. He preached the message and saved the day, and everyone believed the message, and they all turned from their evil, and we all live happily ever after. <clears throat> no. Chapter 4, everybody. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. 
he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a generous and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. God has just spoken through Jonah to save 120,000 people from destruction. And Jonah, the hero of our story, is now praying to die because he can't live with this. He is so burning with anger. It says that it seemed wrong to him. Like, this isn't right. This isn't right that you, you know who they are. You know the idol worshipers are, that they are. You know the cruel things that you've done, and you're just going to relent and just show them grace. They don't deserve it, and he is just burning with anger. He is furious. It says that it didn't seem wrong. It, it didn't seem right to him. And so I want to kind of pause at this moment to sort of just interject a little something, and that's... This right here proves why we need to find truth in Scripture and not in our feelings, okay? We have to find truth in the Word of God, which is truth, and not in our feelings, because our feelings are not always correct, and we see this with Jonah. I mean, 120,000 people living in this city. This is men, but also women and children and everyone. There's this destruction coming their way, and Jonah is just burning with anger that they're not getting the destruction. That's good. These people are going to live. You're going to let them get away with it. And he's just burning with anger because he was deceived by his feelings. Right? I talked about this verse in Isaiah that uh, I talk about it all the time, that your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. And we see that right here, that Jonah's feelings were not God's feelings. So we don't get to come to the scripture with our feelings. We have to come to it, and this is the truth. Right? The things that I feel, right? He was deceived by his feelings. I, I, this doesn't feel right. It seems wrong. But was it wrong? No, of course not. Jonah was deceived by his feelings. So we have to find the truth in God's word and not in our feelings. I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. So now verse 4, we keep going. Jonah's at the point where it's like, take my life. I can't live like this. If this is what you're going to do, you're going to let these people off the hook. I can't live in a world where they get away with this. And so Jonah says this, or so God replies to Jonah in verse 4, and he simply says, is it right for you to be angry? I love that. I love that God didn't come to Jonah and be like, are you kidding me, dude? Are you serious? You know who you were and what I forgave you of and blah, 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 blah. You know, like he doesn't just unload on them. He doesn't smack them around. He just asks them a question. Hey, Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry? Oh, I love that. What a, what a good, what a great moment where he doesn't, sm I mean, he could have smacked him and been like, dude, you kidding me? You were drowning. You were going to die. I saved your life, buddy. Right? And uh, like, come on, get it together here, Jonah. But no, he just meets him and says, is it right for you to be angry? Let's think about this. Man, the power of a question over just unloading on someone. So he just asks him this question to ponder. Hey, Jonah, let me turn this on you. Let, let me ask this to you. Is it right for you to be angry? Well, <laughs> obviously not. So what does Jonah do, do? He just ignores that question. He doesn't answer that question. And he goes outside of the city. He goes to the east of the city, and he builds himself a shelter to the east of the city. So he's kind of still in view. And he's going to camp out here, and he's going to watch how things unfold. And it's almost like you can feel Jonah like, <laughs> I can't believe this. Like, he's just like, oh, man, I, I, I hope they change their minds. I, I hope they trip back up. I hope that they, that they, that they, that they, that they screw up and that, that that destruction comes right back their way. And you can just see he's just burning in this anger. And he, he builds this, this shelter like maybe they're going to blow it. Maybe, maybe they'll turn back away from God and they'll get that destruction that's coming their way. And so Jonah's just sitting here watching over the city, just burning in rage. And it says, Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his dis discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. 
But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. <laughs> Rough. So, first thing, as Jonah is here in his bitterness and his unforgiveness and his rage and his anger and his disgust over God's grace, <laughs> God comes and meets him right where he's at. And he provides this little plant to come and shade him and comfort him. Isn't that amazing? Like, he, in the midst of Jonah's junk and, like, God could have been like, dude, come on, get it together, you know, like, but he doesn't. He, again, he doesn't give up on him. He still shows love to Jonah, and he provides this little plant for him, which gives him shade. So he meets Jonah right where he is. But then, the next day, this little worm comes along and eats the plant, and so the plant withers. Well, what's interesting is it says that God provided this plant for Jonah, but it also says that God provided the worm. Isn't that interesting? Like God provided this plant to meet Jonah right there in the midst of his discomfort, but then the same exact word provided, he then provided a worm to take away the thing that was comforting him. And so it's, it's like such an interesting thing. And so God provided this plant to comfort him in his distress. But ultimately, God is not going to enable Jonah to just sit here and simmer in his rage and his anger. He's not going to just sit here and comfort him as he sits in this unjust state of bitterness and rage and boiling. He's not going to just let him sit there and enable him as he goes. So he meets him where he's at, and he provides him with this comfort, lets him know, I still love you, I'm still coming after you, but we can't stay here, Jonah. <laughs> We can't stay here. We got to move on from this. We got to move away from this. Then verse 8 gets even worse. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. So once again, we see that God has to use nature against Jonah <laughs> because, of, because of who he was and his rebellious spirit and his, his, just, his stubbornness. God once again has to send in nature to get Jonah's attention. And once again, Jonah says, just let me die. Just take my life from me. I don't want to live like this anymore. Will you just let me die? Just take my life. And in verse 9, he asked him a question again, a question that we had just heard. This whole book rhymes. It's got this, these, this rhyme and this really cool flow to it. And he says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Again, he turns around the question, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry? God asked him this question just like he did before. Last time he didn't answer. This time Jonah does answer. He says, it is. And I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Oh, gosh, what kind of anger is this guy going through? It's just again and again, like, God, stop it. I don't want to have this conversation. Just kill me. But is it right for you to be angry? I, just kill me. But Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Just take my life. I am so angry. I want to be dead. Please put me out of my misery here. And then this is how the book closes. Very, very odd ending to this story. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I have not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And that's the end of a story. Isn't that weird? The story ends with a question. The story ends with a question. And we, so Jonah never responds. We don't know. What happens? What happens next? What, what does Jonah say after this? How did, like God finally spoke to him and he gives him this, 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 this little speech here. And it just ends on God's question. What happens to Jonah? You make your way through Scripture. Jonah is mentioned a couple times, but we never hear what happens next. We never hear the end of the story. We don't know how Jonah responds, but ultimately it doesn't matter. 
Because if God wanted us to know more, he would have told us more. And the real question is, is how do we respond to this? How do we respond to this story? Like we were talking about last week, this, this story of Jonah is very odd because it's a, it's a book of prophecy that doesn't focus on the words of the prophet, but rather the story of the prophet. And so this story is told for God's people. It's told for us so that we can see the life of Jonah and we can learn from the life of Jonah. There's this verse in uh, Romans 15, verse 4. It says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scripture and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So everything that was written in the past, these, these Scriptures of long ago, this Old Testament that we now call it, these Scriptures were written so that through it we can, we can learn this endurance that is taught through the, the Scripture, so that it can provide encouragement for us and that through it we may be filled with hope. And so the story is, the question is, is how does the story of Jonah do that for us today? Well, there's so many awesome little things that we learn from the story of Jonah. There's a couple things I want to go back through and just kind of pick apart and point out just some simple truths that we find in this story. And the first thing that we see is that when God says something, he means it. When God says something, he means it. So the book opens with God telling Jonah, hey, you're going to go to Nineveh, and you're going to preach against it. Well, then Jonah runs, and he gets on a boat. God sends a storm. God sends a fish. Gets spit up back on the shore, and we're right back at square one. Hey, Jonah, you're going to go to the great city of Nineveh, and you're going to proclaim the message that I give you. God does not change his mind. His word is true no matter what happens. So when God says something, he means it. And the actions of men do not change God's word. The times don't change God's word. The culture does not change God's word. God's word means what it means. When he says it, he means it. And so that simple truth, man, that fills me with so much hope so that when I read through the scripture, and I read something, I read the promises of his word, I know he means it, right? He's not going to change, he doesn't change, he doesn't go back on his word, well, the time has changed, that's not really that woke these days, I mean, that can, like, it means what it means, he's a man of his word, and he does what he says he's going to do, and that is good news for us today, that when we go to this word, we have these time and time again where God proves his word to be true, that he does not change, and we see it in action here in the book of Jonah. We see it repeated throughout Scripture, but we have that simple reminder that when God says something, he means it. Another thing we learn from the book of Jonah, this is another one of those kind of like simple things that we all try and teach our kids is that we should probably listen the first time, <laughs> right? We should probably just go ahead and listen the first time. When God calls us to something, when, when God calls us to obedience, we should probably just go ahead and do it the first time. Uh, uh, when we look at the story of Jonah, he didn't do what God called him to do the first time, but guess what? He ended up doing it. And all he did through his disobedience was bring a whole bunch of, of mess into his life. All he did was add on a three-night stay in the belly of a fish because of his disobedience, and he ends up doing the same exact thing that God told him he was going to do. Right? So we should probably just listen the first time. Right? That's what we teach our kids. Like When I say something, I don't want to have to say it six times and then, oh, Oh, you want me to clean the room. Oh, okay, I get it now. Sorry, it took me an hour to, to you know, get the message. No, like, we should just listen that first time. When we disobey, things don't go well. And when God calls us to something, we should just go ahead and do it the first time. I want to tell you my favorite part about the book of Jonah. This is a scripture that we've already shared a couple times just in this first day, these first last two weeks. It's, it's when Jonah responds to God and tells him why he didn't want to go. Just this simple statement of who God is. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Other versions say a God who uh, is abounding in steadfast love, like a love that continues. It is steadfast. It doesn't change. I just love that simple reminder. And, and, and the best part, the, the thing I love most about this book is that it doesn't just say it, 
but we, we see it in action. We see God actually do these things. And so it's funny that, that Jonah, despite his junk, gives a pretty spot-on description of who God is. And so God used Jonah to speak to the Ninevites and to give him this word that he had been speaking. And, and then this word that, that, that was used there in Nineveh, here we are thousands of years later and is still speaking to us today. And so last week I asked you to kind of Pay attention as we make our way through this story of the things that we learn about God, the, the characteristics of God that we see throughout this story. And so we see this simple sort of description here that God is gracious and compassionate. So Jonah says that, but ultimately we see it in action because God showed grace to the Ninevites. We see that God showed grace to Jonah, that he's slow to anger. So many opportunities where God could have been very angry at Jonah where he is running from what he's called him to do, God doesn't respond in anger. As he's sitting there burning in rage after God has just done this incredible thing, God doesn't respond in anger. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. He didn't give up on Jonah. Even as Jonah ran away, he didn't give up. He didn't go find another person. Even as Jonah's sitting there burning with rage, he still meets Jonah where he's at. He is abounding in steadfast love. And finally, he relents from sending calamity. And we see that uh, right in action where calamity is coming their way. And God relents after they repent from sending this calamity their way. And then Jonah, who has gotten himself into this horrible situation where he gets thrown overboard, is now there to drown. God still relents, and he sends the fish to save him. So we have this reminder of who God is. I think this is so important because what we've really been talking about through this story, and the thing that I hope is that this story would challenge us all to go and live missionally. That this story would challenge us to go back into the world and live boldly for Christ. To go out there and live missionally. And when we start with the truth of who God is, of just reminding ourselves of who he is, man, that's such an empowering thing. Because just like Jonah, when he's called to go to Nineveh, it seems like this scary task, right? And a lot of times the things that God calls us to might seem scary, it might seem intimidating, it might seem hard, it might seem difficult, it might seem uncomfortable. And so when we start with the truth of who God is, that he is compassionate, he is gracious, he's slow to anger, he is abounding in steadfast love, that's who he is. So when he calls us to something, we can trust him, right? Like if you're calling me here and that's who you are, you're, you're, you're abounding in steadfast love and you're going to call me to this, I know that I can trust you, that I can take that step out, that knowing who's calling out to me, that I can trust it. And so ultimately we talked about, right, where, where the enemy swoops in. It's like, no, 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 this is scary. Don't do this. Get on the boat. It's nice. It's a luxurious ship. It'll take you away from the big scary task. But ultimately that's, the thing that we have to fear, the disobedience, running from the things that God has called us to. So sure, the things that, that God is calling us to may seem scary, but when we understand who God is, we understand and there's nothing scary about being within his calling. The fear is when we're outside of it, right? The fear is when we're running from him, when we aren't pursuing obedience to him. So starting with that truth that this is who our God is. And so when he calls me to something, on the surface, it might seem scary or intimidating or all these things. Then the enemy comes in to get in my ear with all the excuses. But I'm going to turn away from that and I'm just going to remind myself of the truth of who my God is, of who it is that's calling to me. Just like Peter, when he steps out into that storm, right? When he saw Jesus, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the man who, who commands the winds and waves. He has authority over it all. So even in the midst of the storms, I can get out of the boat. So sure, that storm probably looks scary. Oh, there's all the reasons to fear. But when he sees Jesus, the fear disappears. So we've got to remember who it is who's calling us, who it is that's calling to us, and that that's who he is, and so that we can trust him. So that's sort of my favorite part of the verse. Can I share my second favorite part of the passage? Right? So that's my, my, my favorite part, just that simple truth of who God is. Man, how empowering is that? But my, the second thing that I love most about this scripture is just the simple message that Jonah preached. The, simple, the simplicity of this message that Jonah was given 
by God. And it was given to him by God, right? So when God tells him to go to Nineveh, it's not like, oh man, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a rough place. Those people are idol worshipers. They are cruel. They are violent. They are like, how, I'm, man, I got to come up with something good to say to them that I'm going to somehow try and get them to turn away from, the, from worshiping their idols and their violence and, and all these things and get them to turn to God. This is intimidating. What am I going to say to these people? But I love it. At the end of the day, he just preached that simple message and it was God that they believed. They believed God. It doesn't say that, you know, Jonah was very convincing and so they all believed him, right? No, it's just they believed God. Jonah spoke this simple message, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. And it transformed 120,000 people's lives. And it's just this simple message. And I love that. Because, like, we, we can make all the excuses in the world. No, that's this big, scary test. It's five words here, Jonah, five words. I just need you to go. Will you just be obedient? Will you step out and just say these five words? It's such an interesting message because it's not, not even just how short it was, right? But just the, the, let's look at the content of it. He's going to these idol-worshiping, cruel, violent people and just says, 40 more days and this city will be overturned. He doesn't say what they've done wrong. He doesn't say what they should do instead. He doesn't even mention God. Like, I'm pretty sure he's breaking all the rules of preaching here. Like, what, they, what, what, just 40 more days, this city will be overturned. That's it. That's all he says. And God used this message to transform a city. So I'm like, I imagine if that's me, God says, hey, I need you to go to this wild, crazy city. I need you to preach this message I'm going to give you. I'll be like, all right, God, what you got? I'm ready. What's my message? 40 more days, and it will be overturned. Okay, 40 more days, it will be overturned. All right, what's next? <laughs> That's it. That's all you're going to say. Like, what? You're sa- you know who those people are? You know the things that's going on in that place? I'm supposed to say these just five words? That's going to do it? But that's the truth of the story, is that it wasn't about Jonah. It was about God, and it was about God's ability to use the message that God gave him. It was all about God. Jonah just said the words, and God used it. God used Jonah, and God used those words, and God transformed his city just using those five words. And uh, uh, the content of the sermon, let's be honest, for me as a preacher, like, you know, I kind of take this job seriously. I love doing this. Like, I want, you know, and when I hear someone preach a good message, I'm like, yeah, good, good job. I'm going to be honest for a moment. This is a total weak message here. It's a total weak sermon. I mean, he didn't open with an interesting story. He did not have any great jokes to keep our attention. Uh, He does not have any cool illustrations or anything like that. Nevertheless, just five words, and God transformed this place. Forty more days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And so what a good reminder that all God needs us to do is our part, Amen. right? It's God, let me tell you something. God is not calling you to be the Holy Spirit, okay? God is not calling you to, to do God's part. He's just calling you to do your part, right? So, like, I can be intimidated by a tap. Oh, man, I'm going to go talk to this person. I'm going to share my faith with them. I know the way they sin. They're really bad sinners. Like, how, what am I going to say? What am I going to do to somehow convict them of their sin and make them turn to God? I, I can't do that. And I shouldn't put that burden on myself. And God is not calling me to be God. God's just calling me to obedience. Just go be my mouthpiece. You open your mouth and see how I use it. Right? God is just calling us to do our part. We are not called to be God. We are not called to be the Holy Spirit. We cannot convict people's hearts. We cannot save people. That's, that's God's part. So we just have to be obedient to do what God has called us to do to be obedient to the way that he has commissioned us, to go into this world and live missionally, to share this message, and just be the mouthpiece. And maybe you think, like, I don't know, what am I going to say? Five words here. Look what God did. Look at what God did. So, like, we can, we can make the excuses, right? Like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what to say, and I don't know enough. And what if they ask me hard questions? Or, like, there's, there's got to be someone who's more qualified than me. Like, God should just send someone else. No, 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 no. When we make the excuses, the only thing we're doing is removing God from the equation, right? When we make those excuses, we're putting it on us. And yet, on our own, yeah, we're doomed. There's nothing we can do, but we're not called 
to, to do that part. We're just called to do our part and let God do his part. We just need to be obedient to do what he calls us to do and then trust God with the results. So Jonah goes and he delivers these words just goes and does what he was told to do. And, and I, would, I would love to witness that because we're not told, like, how Jonah went. We just know that eventually he said, I'll, I'll hold up my end of the deal, I'll do it. And then he goes, he gives them a message, and he preaches those words. We don't know if, God, like, if Jonah went into the city and was like, <laughs> 40 more days, this place is going to get overthrown, right? We don't know if, like, he's crossing his arms, he's rolling his eyes. We know that he literally does not want them to repent. This is the worst preacher of all time, right? Like... <laughs> Imagine you come up to me and say, hey, pastor, I really loved your, your message on forgiveness last week. It was so convicting, and I got someone that I need to go ask for forgiveness this, this, right after this. I'm going to go call him up, and I say, dang it. Oh, you did what I, what? It's like, no, this is, he's the worst, the worst preacher of all time here. Like, he does not want them to, so we don't know. We're not given the details of how he delivered this message. If he went there pouty, if he got his arms crossed, he's rolling his eyes. We don't know any of those details, but we know who this guy is. And so we don't know any of that. But again, ultimately, it doesn't matter. Because God used his words. God used those words. So somehow, some way, God took those five words without giving all the details and all the, the, all the, the, you know, what they had to do and how they had to change and what they had to stop doing. God used those five words to transform the lives of 120,000 people. That they were so serious that they turned from their evil ways. They said, we are done. We are done. This ends today. We are ending our evil ways. We're going to take off our robes. We're going to put on sackcloth. We are going to humble ourselves before this God. We are going to fast. We are not going to eat. We are not going to drink. None of our animals will eat and drink. And we are going to show this God that we have repented and we are going to turn to him and everyone go pray urgently to this God and maybe he will relent. And so the question that I want to share with you guys is that if God could use Jonah, this grumpy, rebellious, arrogant, self-righteous prophet with a bad attitude, why, why do we still doubt that he could use us too? Why do we doubt that he could use us? Right? We get so tricked up when we start trying to do God's part. Like, oh man, this is intimidating. I don't know. Like, I, I know the things they do. I don't know if I can make them change. I don't know if I have the word. God is not calling us to that. He's just calling us to do our part. And I'll share personally, I deal with this every week. I got to get up here and preach. And like I said, I take this seriously. And like, I want to come. And then every week I want, I want, like, God, give me something. Let me... Let me just preach your word, Lord. I want to. I want to be used by you, God. Would you? Would you? Would you use your word in this place to transform people, to, to help them to live a life that better reflects Jesus? And, and sometimes I can get caught up in this. Like, oh man, is this message good enough? Like, I can be overthinking it, and I'm going back through my notes. Like, I don't know, is this convincing enough? And it's like, at the end of the day, like, I, there's no, I can't be convincing enough to be the Holy Spirit in your life. I cannot speak eloquently enough to make you change or do anything. And that's not my job. Like, that's not my job. And if I put that burden on myself, like, I'm just, I'm just robbing myself of the opportunity that God actually has to use me. So I just have to come and say, look, oh, this is God's word. There it is. And then I got to pray, Lord, will you use that? It's not about me. I'm going to do my part. And then I got to let God do his part. I got to get out of the way. Right? And this is something we see all throughout scripture. Jesus himself even said it with his disciples. Matthew 10, verse 14. Jesus gathers his disciples. And uh, sorry, I clicked my button way too many times. So Jesus gathers his disciples and he says, And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. So Jesus gathers his disciples and he tells them that he's giving them authority to drive out evil spirits and do incredible things. I'm giving you guys authority that you're going to do things and people are going to be like, how did that happen? Yet still people are going to reject you. Yet still, people are not going to listen to you. And when that happens, dust off your boots and move on, right? We know the, the story uh, of the sower, like the, the parable of the sower. You just throw in the seeds, throw in the seeds. 75% of those seeds are dying, getting eaten by birds, getting choked out by weeds. Just keep throwing the seed. God's just calling us to do our part. The results are not in our hands. It's all on God. God's in control. He's the one who does the work in people's hearts. 
We just got to be obedient. We just got to be obedient to do his part. And the last thing that I want to point out about this story is that no one, no one has sunk so far that they cannot receive grace. I love this story. We see the pagan sailors turn to God. The evil, idol-worshiping Ninevites receive God's grace. Jonah himself receives God's grace. So no matter how far you have run, you haven't gotten too far because God is pursuing you. He's coming after you. And if you have not yet received that grace of God, I pray that this morning that you would turn to him. He is a God who is abounding in steadfast love. He loves you. His mercy is new every morning. And he invites us in to receive this grace. He paid the price. Jesus went to the cross. He took our guilt. He took our shame so that through him we can have life. So the question is this morning is, have you received that grace? And then the second question is, if the answer is yes, have you received that grace? The next question is, does your life now reflect that grace? Does your life now reflect the grace that you received? And when we look at Jonah, it didn't. It definitely didn't. See, we all want grace, right? We all want grace. We want God to show us grace. But then sometimes we look at other people and like, but damn, like they don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. And we want God to show his grace and even, you know, like God continue to bless me. Like even, I know I've fallen short and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do exactly right. But God, show me grace. Will you please still bless me? But then we look when God brings blessings into other people's lives and like this jealousy rises up. Like what? Like they're getting that? This isn't right. And we can find ourselves in that same state of Jonah. And Jonah is a great reminder of why we just celebrated Easter. That none of us got what we deserved. That it was by nature we were all deserving of wrath. But there's a God who is abounding in steadfast love. He is a God of grace and compassion. And he sent Jesus on, uh, sent Jesus to that cross in our place to take the wrath that we deserve so that the calamity that was coming our way could be removed and placed on to Jesus. And that through him we could receive life, life abundantly. And so the story ends with Jonah and he's left burning in anger and he's hoping for death because God forgave his enemies. And the story reminds us that God forgave us while we were his enemies. Romans uh, Romans 5, verse 9 and 10, "Since since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, we, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more have we been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? While we were his enemies, while we were running, while our backs were turned to him, while we were enemies of God and we had done nothing to deserve anything good from his hands, just like Jonah, burning with anger, mad about his grace. God still met us where we were. He pursued us. He tracked us down. He sent Jesus to a cross in our place. So that's the way we were treated while we were enemies. And so the question is, how do we now treat our enemies? Does our life reflect the grace that we've received? How do I respond to my enemies? I know how God has responded to me while I was his enemy, so how do I respond to my enemies? And when I'm wronged, how do I respond? And when I'm offended, how do I respond? Jonah had this bad attitude, and guess who it affected? No one but himself. God still used Jonah's word, and the pagan sailors repent, and Nineveh repents, and they're receiving new life. Like, oh, destruction was coming our way, and they repent, and they turn to God, and the calamity that was coming their way is removed from them, and they have just received this grace and this new life free from the evil. And Jonah is the one sitting there burning with anger and hoping for death. So Jonah, reading through this story, gives us an opportunity. We've got to check our hearts here. We gotta check our hearts and see, is there any bitterness that has taken root in here? Is there any grudges that I am holding on to? Is there un- any unforgiveness that is festering here? Because we gotta uproot that from our life and run from it because we can see the destruction it brings. That Jonah being used in an incredible way, 120,000 people saved from destruction because God used the words he spoke and he's burning in rage. 
So we got to take this serious. We can't just let a little bit of bitterness grow, a little bit of unforgiveness grow. Man, we got to flee from it. We got to run from it. We got to uproot it. And so we learn so much from the story of Jonah, a lot of negative things, a lot of the things that we shouldn't do, right? The, the traps to avoid. But also we see a lot of positive things, a lot of encouraging things, challenges us to check our hearts, to make sure that the lives we're living are reflecting the grace that we see we received we see that god is a man of his word that he never changes we see that he's full of compassion he is full of grace and he's abounding in steadfast love and he wants to use his people for his purposes and since we have that promise of who he is we can trust him we can trust that he loves us And we can step out in confidence. And we can step out in boldness. We can run and overcome the excuses that the enemy tries to put in our way because we know that they're traps. We know that it looks like a nice boat, but it ends with a sea and a dirty, stinky fish. (laughs) So we can overcome those things when we're reminded of who our God is, who it is that's calling out to us. So will you live boldly, knowing that it's not on you? It's not our words but it's God. It's all on him. They didn't believe the words of Jonah. They believed God. So we are just called to do our part. So we step out boldly, knowing that this is who our God is, and he wants to use us. And that while it might seem scary, it might seem uncomfortable, we can step out and trust him because we know who he is. So let's just do our part. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you, and God, we thank you for who you are. And God, we thank you for the truth of this scripture. God, we thank you that while we were your enemies, you you sent Jesus for us. We thank you that you were full of grace and full of compassion. You're abounding in steadfast love. God, I thank you that you relented from sending calamity in my way, but you placed it on Jesus. So God, I pray that we would live reflecting the grace that we've received and that God we wouldn't try and overcomplicate it that we wouldn't try and 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 take the role of the Holy Spirit but God we would simply step out and be obedient to just do what you've called us to do to just do our part and trust you with the results to trust you to do the hard work so God I pray over this church God would you raise up the members of this church to go into their communities as we leave these doors to go out and live boldly for a mission to make your name known that they would overcome the excuses god that we would be used for your purposes god we love you we thank you for who you are that's in the name of jesus we pray amen